Hello and welcome to another episode of Wise Counsel Weekly. I am your host, Tanyan Farley, and I have my co-host, Alex Francis, with me this morning. Alex, how are we doing? Doing all right, man. We've had a busy week so far, but we're pushing through it. Yeah, it's this is one of those weeks that I feel like the 4th of July week, you always anticipate to be a, a slower week. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. it has been definitely a very busy week for sure with the yeah. 4th of July at the end of the week complete opposite and we're trying to chug it all out before we have beers on friday so <laughs> we're working through it <laughs> for sure for sure and we we have a packed episode today as well um our topic of the week uh this week is turning your passion into your business so really that entrepreneurial journey and really how if you're not an entrepreneur and you're looking for a career to follow in how finding your passion and and finding a way to roll that into what you do for your work can be great for you and for your employer as well. So uh, we also have our guest that will speak on that today, who is uh, Lindsay Schultz, the founder of Lindsay Lee Jewelry, uh, better known as Houston Diamond Girl on Instagram and Twitter. So I'm sure most of you out there have probably already seen her stuff, or if not, go ahead and give her a look. She's got a bunch of really cool custom pieces, and she takes great care of her customers. We'll talk to her a little bit about how she became an entrepreneur, why she jumped from being a successful employee and the truth about entrepreneurship, right? Not the right. Uh, the social media uh, fad that's sweeping right now where you just put entrepreneur and then travel around. So uh, then we'll move on to quick hits with managing partner, Bobby Dixon. Uh, talk through you know a man who has been an entrepreneur several times over. And then our big three today is underrated entrepreneurial success stories. So there are a couple like big time entrepreneurs we'll definitely mention just because they should always be mentioned with the word entrepreneurs brought up. But we're going to dive into hopefully some that aren't as publicly known. So let's go ahead and dive into game time, Alex. So first thing we really want to talk through is how does working in something you're passionate about impact your productivity and success? So this could be either as Mm -hmm. an entrepreneur or as an employee. Gotcha. 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 I mean, honestly, uh, being an entrepreneur or, or in a business that I'm passionate about, it, it drives me more than, you know, when I was working a nine to five somewhat um, in those aspects, because uh, being in a business I want to grow in and at a company that I want to see excel in all aspects, it's a driving force inside of me that's getting me fulfilled every single day. You know, sometimes you hate being at a stagnant position. And sometimes when you're in a role at a nine to five, then you feel that way. Like you feel like you're not climbing the ladder. You're feeling that someone's not respecting you and the work that you're doing. And, that can that can dwell on you, you know, in your on some on your mental state, um, and how you want to come and wake up in the morning, and how you feel like showing up at at work, and you know, at two o'clock you're like, oh, I just want to take a nap, or I'm ready to get out of here at five on Friday, and it's just not the way you want to be when you want to continue to push and grow and 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 value their business. Um, and this career pumps fuel into me each and every day uh, to be better in business and as well as my personal life. So it's a major boost on my overall productivity and success. How about you? Oh, I think that's, I think the last piece is what is really important from what you just said, which is mm-hmm. your career, what you're doing for work pumps, it pumps life into your, your personal life, right? It makes you excited. It makes you, you know, excited to start the day. It makes you excited to take on tasks. I think you hit a couple of key points, right? And I know the one for me is that there have been careers and, and jobs that I've been a part of where it felt like I was just kind of going through the motions. And I think there's a lot of people that are going through that. I think for me, finding what I truly like to do, right? So whatever that is. So for me, I realized pretty early on that I wanted to find ways to help people and solve complex problems. Right. To me, that was just, I mean, I've always liked like fun games that like solve problems. I've always thought like mysteries were fun. And so when I had the opportunity to do consulting, I was like, this is what I'm doing every day. Yep. And when you, when you get to work for a company as well, that uh, feels the same way as you do and, and looks to do that. then I think that's really exciting. and gets you motivated to do it every day. I know there are a lot of folks that are still trying to figure out what they want to do. And I don't blame you. I think that for, you know, most of our lives, we will kind of figure out what exactly it is we want to do, but I would encourage you to find things that you like to do not necessarily from a work perspective, but from a life perspective, and then find work opportunities that translate to that. You know, we'll talk a little about that with, with Lindsay Schultz in a minute, but she talks about how she really enjoyed fashion and creativity and she wanted to like better serve the customer experience. And so she came up with this idea, right? And so 
for us in, in consulting, it's really similar. So, but you have to continue to grow yourself in your passion. So Alex, what are some ways that, that you can grow your ability to excel in your passion, whether as an employee or as an entrepreneur? Um, honestly, the first thing that comes to mind is just to embrace all the aspects of that passion. You know, if you're a buyer in retail, um, you want to learn what the planner's doing. You want to learn the aspects of your replenishment side. You want to understand what your advertising department is doing and, and those items that you're for, uh, for those items that you're purchasing. Um, going all in on what you're passionate about only leads to better understanding and better results. Take a take an NFL quarterback. Uh, now, of course, their one job is to, you know, throw the ball down the field. But when they embrace the whole program, when they embrace the whole scheme, that offensive program, they dive in and they learn what, you know, every position is doing on the field. So when they go out there to play in, in a game and it's a dire situation, they know which play to make. Um, and they make the better play and the best play for that team because they, have, they know all aspects of what's going on out there. And ultimately, that's what leads you to being a great player instead of a good player, um, you know, just doing, instead of just doing a bare minimum uh, and, and, you know, quote unquote, your job, which is just throwing the ball. Yeah, no, I think that's dead on. I think that takes really the theory that I have about it, which is, you know, if you have something you're passionate about, there's always something that you think there can be better in that passion, or there's a better way to do it, or there's an unfulfilled need in that passion. So you talking about, you know, the quarterback that goes above and beyond or the buyer that goes to understand what the person on the other side is thinking, that's a way to better improve the overall life of your passion. And so I think that's really what I would focus on for, for myself and for folks that are maybe trying to figure out a way to, to grow themselves in that is to look at whatever it is you're passionate about, right? Whether it's problem solving, whether it's people, whether it's, you know, helping kids, whether it's, you know, sick people, whatever it is. And then think about where the pain points are in that journey, right? Is it that payment processing takes way too long? Is it that customer service is not good because, the people involved in the customer service journey don't enjoy what they're doing? Is it that there's not enough information being shared between the customer and the organization? If those are the cases, right, that's where you can focus on how to better channel your desire to work in your passion and to focus on your passion and find ways to better improve the experience for not only you, but for the people around you. Mm -hmm. And with that, I mean, that gives you the ability to come up with creative and new ideas, right? And, And plan out those ideas to go forth and and really bring about your passion. So um, we'll talk about this last piece a little bit with Lindsay and with Bobby, but I think that there's a huge misconception about uh, chasing your passion and about being an entrepreneur. And and I blame this a hundred percent on social media these days, which is that, (laughs) you know, someone says, Oh, you know, I'm just chasing my passion or I'm an entrepreneur, but there's really nothing that goes into it. Right. And we've talked about this before, but a lot of it's just, you know, they have family money and, and they're really just, you know, doing side hustles to for fun, right? Really chasing your passion and being an entrepreneur is hard. It's really, really hard because oftentimes you're the only one that believes in what you're doing. Mm-hmm. You're the only one that <clears throat> truly knows the outcome that you want. And I think too, you know, we talk about this with Lindsay, but there is the saying that, you know, if you do what you love, you never work a day in your life. And right. Alex, I know you and I have both talked about this, but work is work. Like even when you love to do, it's still work. It's still going to be hard. There's still going to be those late night phone calls that you got to figure out how to solve something that's going on. So I think, you know, for someone that's chasing their passion, you should know that it's going to be hard and that the, the reality of, the situation is that there's going to be things you're going to have to fight through. There's going to be adversity. I think some things we've talked about in the previous podcast definitely tie into this, which is you have to find ways to be resilient. You mm-hmm. have to find ways to be innovative and you have to find ways to deliver on the need. Right. I'm not discouraging you from doing it because we're both doing it. Right. 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 Um, but I'm saying that there are going to be things that you're going to have to realize that working at a, a nine to five job, is not chasing your passion most of the time, right? Because that other piece consumes your life. Uh, when you're truly chasing your passion, it's it's all the time. You're never off. That doesn't mean you can't have fun with friends and family and have mm-hmm. other pursuits, but you're thinking about it all the time. So what do you think about that, Alex? Yeah, that last peak that you touched on was uh, how I was going to jump into this topic. But, but real quick, real quick. So you're telling me if I if I put entrepreneur in my bio on social media, then I'm 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 not fully an entrepreneur yet. That's what you're saying. <laughs> that that's your label, man. That's your label. <laughs> oh, oh, got it, got it, got it, got it. 
But yeah, I mean, that piece right there that you touched on is, um, you know, when you're chasing that passion, it won't be the same life that you have when you, when you have a normal nine to five. Uh, you know, when you're an employee or, you know, even at a, a, a large firm or a corporate business, all the way down to a, a, a McDonald's, you're an employee, you're, you're just, you're a part of that overall business. You are the overall business. Um, you know, everything doesn't fall on your shoulders. Everything doesn't solely, um, solely lie on you. Of course, you can always clock out come back to do it tomorrow or somebody else will pick it up on the next shift or, uh, you know, and also, you know, pay paychecks are constant. Insurance is all good. You know, taxes are taken care of vacation times all put in. But the second half of that is when you're, when you're chasing your passion, there isn't a clock out. Like you mentioned, there isn't someone that'll finish it later. It's all on you. It's all on you putting that effort for it and turning, uh, you know, your passion into profit to make sure that paycheck stays constant. Uh, you know, taxes aren't an afterthought now. Yeah, the top of mind. Insurance just isn't given to you. You have to set it up uh, for your situation. That's not HR's job anymore. Um, so you just know that, you know, there's a lot of responsibilities and aspects of your business that you've never really thought of before that come all together as your number one priorities when you're an entrepreneur. Yeah. I mean, it, there's a lot that goes into it and we're by no means trying to scare anyone out of it, but we're trying to give you the reality <laughs> of the situation. Right? And, and we've seen it working in a, you know, a small firm that's continued to grow the the hats you have to wear and the, the responsibilities that fall upon you and the things you worry about that you would never worry about as a member of a, a bigger organization. Right. And the, the only way I can kind of parlay that into, you know, an employee that's chasing their passion within organizations. I think that's great too, is you start to realize that you really care about the company as a whole. And because of that, you start to care about more things. And because of that, it starts to take on more time in your life. So that's really the parallel I think we would draw and, it's funny, you know, that's kind of the story that Lindsay's going to tell here when we bring her on in just a second is, you know, she started to really care about the client experience when she was an employee and how they're being treated. And she saw the only way to fix that was to really start her own thing and, and kind of grow her own business. So without any more waiting, we are going to bring on Lindsay Schultz, the founder of Lindsay Lee Jewelry, um, to talk a little bit about how she moved from employee to starting and growing a very successful jewelry and, and fashion brand. All right. We now welcome on our guest today, Lindsay Schultz, the founder, owner, really the everything of Lindsay Lee Jewelry here in Houston. Um, for those of you that aren't located in Houston, you probably know her as Houston Diamond Girl on social media. So Lindsay, good morning. How are you? Good morning. I'm doing well. How are y'all? Ready for the weekend, that's for sure. <laughs> weekend? Yeah. It's Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> no. Close Friday, you know, there's just two more days. We're almost gotcha, there. Gotcha. <laughs> hey, I like it. I like it. You got to take advantage of the holiday weeks. Yes. So, optimistic. So, so for those that don't know, so Lindsay uh, runs an incredibly successful jewelry and design uh, group here in Houston and is really focused on really engagement rings is, is a big part of your business, but she does a ton of other custom jewelry as well. Lindsay's actually working on a custom piece for me um, that's going to be pretty cool that we're going to you know look at later this year. So Lindsay, why don't you tell us a little about your background, how you got into this, and, and really just what you're looking to to do with your business. Yes. So I um, went to LSU, graduated in fashion merchandising. I grew up in kind of the Houston like industry of like high-end jewelry, fashion, clothing. I um, started modeling when I was 13 years old. So I modeled for 15 years. And then when I went to LSU, I still did it. And I was like, you know what? I want to get into fashion. I love fashion. Um, so I majored in fashion merchandising and then minored in business and took a few uh, entrepreneurial classes. And I always like knew in the back of my mind, I want to run something. I want to run something. And so when I graduated um, from LSU, I kind of like just like everyone else, didn't know what I was doing and had no experience really too much in jewelry. But I went to a trip to Thailand and this was the time when all those flash tattoos came out. And the only store that had these flash tattoos that weren't sold out were, was this jewelry store in Houston. So I went there and I bought all these tattoos and they messaged me and they were like, hey, if you ever need a job, obviously it looks like you do come work for us. We need, a, we need help. So I was like, okay, I got back to Houston and I was like, dang, I really don't have a job. Um, so I reached out to them and I was like, Hey, if y'all were serious about that job, I'd love to come work for y'all. So I started off as a, an assistant manager and then moved up pretty quickly. Um, 
I was then the manager after like six months. So I ran the entire store. I knew how the ins and outs. I was the buyer. I managed about five girls. Um, it was fun. I got to go to trade shows and learn how to buy, learn how to sort, um, all about diamonds and all about gemstones and all about fine jewelry. And we also did costume jewelry. So it was like, it was a little bit of both worlds that I really enjoyed. Um, we did a tiny bit of custom jewelry work. So it wasn't like something that I totally got to dive into. And then when I worked there for three years, I was kind of like, all right, I'm hitting a ceiling, doing the same thing. I need to grow. So another jeweler in Houston reached out to me to do custom engagement rings, wedding bands, only custom bridal work, which I then started there. I got my GIA certificate up in New York, um, finished all my courses, was totally certified in diamonds. And then I decided, you know what? Engagement rings and wedding bands, bridal jewelry is just not all exactly what I want to do. Mm -hmm. My whole picture to come together. So I decided to launch Lindsay Lee Jewelry and have my, you know, the retail side of things, but also solely custom, solely engagement rings, um, and have a little bit of mix of everything. Because to me, that was the fun part, was like getting to go to trade shows, being a buyer, um, meeting with random people that were coming in and shopping, and not just wedding band and engagement ring guys. And so, um, and the more I learned about doing a wedding band or a custom piece for a male is that you then become their jeweler. So they're calling you for everything. Um, they need a, I'm sorry, gift. They only want to spend $200. Okay, right. you can custom make something within $200. So how about we you know, have these like pre-made pieces or pieces that I can make in bulk um, that hit the right target market of where um, my client wants to be within like, a hundred dollars to five hundred dollars and it not be some like huge gift when they can just you know make it an easy stop by grab something and go um, which is like kind of what i wanted to do i wanted to satisfy all niches of the market and so that's what opted me to open up my e-commerce and at first my e-commerce was just a fun little like, thing to dabble in and then it got bigger so it's been fun and here we are awesome. Wow. Wow. That's an amazing story. I mean, and I've seen that just noticing from your website alone, how your business has expanded. Just like I see your own branding of, uh, you know, jewelry cleaner um, and expanding your business to retail. And I understand that to a hundred percent with my retail background as well. Um, and and yeah. also hitting that ceiling of, you know, working with someone else and being, uh, you know, some of your ideas not coming to fruition completely. So, did that play a part into you um, putting together your own pieces and putting together your own spin on things and actually having that go to, you know, someone else's brand or someone else's business instead of your own pockets? 100%. Um, when I was working for somebody else doing um, custom engagement rings and wedding bands, there was always something I couldn't do. I was never allowed to do something. And so to me, it just turned into a, I'm told no more than I'm told yes. Mm -hmm. And so I felt like I couldn't give my client everything because I was being shut down so much. So if it wasn't a big selling engagement ring, then why is it worth your time? You know what I mean? So it's not worth your time. Don't waste your time on it. Just tell them no. So to me, it was just kind of like, I'm reject. I'm getting rejected by them. I'm rejecting them. And so to me, full circle of like, this doesn't even satisfy all my needs. Like mm -hmm. I need to figure out something else that's going to where I can't hear the words no. And I can always make a yes. Um, which is a learning curve because you can't tell everyone yes, because then it's, you know, yeah, it's right, unsustainable. Right, right. Yeah. And so, which, um, but you know, you find things in the way you can make pieces. So like I have manufacturers all over the world that I can make lower price pieces and I have a whole collection of them and I can, you know, carry all sizes of them and all styles of them. And, you know, clients will come up with, pieces where they're like, hey, let's make this piece and I'll have my manufacturer overseas in Thailand. And then it becomes a set, a huge hit. And so then it becomes part of my collection. So then I will name that piece after the client. Um, oh, that's awesome. Kind of fun. It's, it's now I'm not getting told yes. I mean, no, I'm telling people yes. And then they get to be like, oh, that's my piece. Oh, I saw right. that girl wearing that piece of me. Right. You know what I mean? Oh, so yeah. it's, they feel like it's a little, a little part of them, but touching part on the uh, jewelry cleaner thing which is kind of what built my company I like to say oh okay yeah that's definitely she that is what originally actually drew me to Lindsay was 
I know that I had friends that were talking about how great this jewelry cleaner was. And this, keep in mind, this is before I had ever bought any sort of jewelry for my wife or for myself or anything. And so we went and saw Lindsay and realized, obviously, you know, she talked about how easy she makes the experience for you. And as a dude going to buy, especially, you know, higher priced jewelry items, there's a lot of uncertainty, right? You feel like someone's always trying to take you for a ride. You don't really know what's going on. So her kind of explaining the ins and outs of the business, like you mentioned, is definitely, I think, kind of what, you know, keeps me going back. And I think keeps a lot of people going back as well. So was that, I know you kind of mentioned that early on, but was that really your, the part of the market that you felt like wasn't being fully filled and that you thought you could excel in and, and move in your own space? Yes. So it was really funny. We had a, um, clients would always come in. And if you're selling an engagement ring and a wedding band, you should also, you know, have something that, you know, is like a gift for them to like be able to clean it, not just tell them, Hey, use dish soap and water and toothbrush and scrub it. You know, like that only does so much. And it's like not as satisfying when you're just engaged. So my husband and I came up with this idea of <clears throat> why don't we just invest in jewelry cleaner and give them as gifts to clients that get their wedding bands and their engagement rings through me. Perfect. Loved it. I was like, it was at the beginning when I was, you know, four months old, it was, I was working at my husband's duplex in his like little office. I had a desk literally a desk. And so I'm so thankful for my clients that trusted and came to my house to, <laughs> it was so basic. Um, and so for me, I was like, wow, I'm investing in making all this jewelry cleaner. And so every person I gave away, I was like, John, we just gave one away for free. I just gave another away for free. Like, how am I going to, you know, create yeah. something out of, out of a little cleaner that was so much to invest in. Mm -hmm. So I um, <clears throat> then decided, I was like, you know what, I should start an e-commerce. And my husband was like, let's put the cleaner up there and let's just like show everyone about it. Like tell everyone about it. Um, and so this one client of mine, she is an influencer on, on Instagram, got a hold of it and was like, and then messaged me and was like, this is the best stuff I've ever used. Holy crap, you need to market this. And I was like, really? Like, how do I do that? I don't even know what I'm doing. And then she posted it one day, just free willingly. Okay. And it went crazy. And so it's just kind of like every time she posts it now, it's a viral sensation. And so we've had like random celebrities go to my website and buy the cleaner and post about it. And wow. it's like one little cleaner bottle that I was like counting pennies and dollars on every time I gave one away and was like, yeah. oh, it hurt, you know? Um, now I was like kind of built this like empire for my e-commerce and it's like the foundation of it because now we have cleaning pens and now we have polishing cloth and it's kind of has this whole thing that when people go on they usually don't just buy a cleaner they buy you know a couple other things or they'll buy a necklace or a pair of earrings and so it's i like to say it's the the you know the foundation of Lindsay lee jewelry because it kind of was mm -hmm. Yeah, it's awesome. weird to that's think awesome. that like a cleaner got me out of my duplex. That's true. I mean, that, that <laughs> has to be a inspired story just from I saw in an article that you said you're giving yourself just one year to try out, you know, doing your own thing in jewelry to taking a leap of faith and investing everything uh, in the cleaner that will lead to, the, you know, more marketing for yeah. your jewelry and everything like that. So how is that taking that leap of faith as an entrepreneur uh, when you know, putting everything out on the line to maximize your dreams and your goals? Um, that was really hard. Um, what you see on Instagram is really pretty and really fun. Mm -hmm. the background of it was a really, really, really hard struggle. Um, I was really fortunate enough that I had gotten engaged. So I had my fiance, my husband now, and he was, he, you know, kicked me anytime I'm like, get up, get up, you know, just get up, you know, you can't. And he was the one who kicked me out the door. Basically was like, you cannot work here anymore. You have to try it on your own. Like you have ideas, you have this vision. It's not your vision. Just go do it. And I was like, I can't, I can't. I'd rather have the pennies I was making than ever invest in anything that could potentially fail because the, what people saw me as as a failure would hurt more than ever having money succeeding. Um, so it was really hard for me, but then when I have my husband, who's just like pulling me to do it and he's saying, look, move in with me, I 
you know we're only engaged, it wasn't the plan, you can work from here, we'll figure it out, I'll take care of us. That's when I was like, okay, he's got us financially, yep. I can you know, just try this. And so it took me, you know, a, two engagement rings that I did at my kitchen table and then I got a desk and then it was like, okay, I sold, you know, so it was just kind of like I sold a wedding band and then I got like fixture in my office. You know what I mean? It was just right. kind of Break every time break. I it, yeah. it's like a little bit more. You'd be like, see, you sold two engagement rings this month. Like now you need a desk. You can't do it on your kitchen table. And so, and then all of a sudden, like watching my living room evolve into a waiting room. And I was just like, God, this is like, it was a lot at first. And so you, what people forget when they don't, when they like see entrepreneurs and they think that they're just like living this fun life, building their dream is that you don't hang out with friends. You don't, you work seven days a week, 15 hour days. Um, the person you're with, which is my husband, becomes your everything. You can't, he could barely even like do his own job because I would be calling him every 10 minutes. Hey, I need help with this. I can't get the work. I can't get the wife out of work. You know what I mean? Because there's yeah. so many things that go wrong then that go right. And so once you figure it out and you can like, then, you know, like you make your own, business cards and they're so shitty and they're like <laughs> they're you're printing them off a printer that barely prints color and you know i used a printer that one of his ex-football players roommates left at his house and so we just like scrounged up things we could find and we made it work made it look bigger than it was um because it wasn't big and it wasn't beautiful but it was fun i mean we still look back and we laugh because we're like oh my god we lived in a 600 square foot duplex that was from the 1930s and people came there and bought engagement rings from us lol you know like who are we yeah um, i know that was also the office right that's crazy to think the of beauty was, of yeah. marketing the beauty of marketing man <laughs> <laughs> and like our neighbors like if i it was funny the first time that somebody reached out via my website to book a consultation i didn't know them it was an older gentleman <clears throat> that worked for like a he worked for apache in the woodlands or something like that and didn't know him so he wasn't on Facebook he wasn't on Instagram and he had the most basic website I mean email address so I was like I had to tell my neighbors hey I have this stranger coming over to my house can you just walk in front of my house and like give me the thumbs up if I'm okay or not and I'll tell you if I am so then it was like okay now I need to move somewhere and I got to get out of my house yeah knowing that people are coming to see stones in my home is getting right. dangerous for me because I didn't right. know him yeah and but, that's that's the part of the entrepreneurial journey that I think is lost, especially now in this social media age where you have people posting pictures from all over the world, like, oh, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm like, no, you're not. You have mommy and daddy's money and you're going and traveling. Like, that's a different story. So, you know, and these are the same people that say, you know, if you do what you love, you never work a day in your life. I know for Alex and myself, we're doing what we love and I can promise you it's still work. I'm working. <laughs> so can you, can you comment on that a little bit? I mean, you talked about the things you had to give up and, and the community around you that helped shape it, but you know, the entrepreneur is obviously a lot of hard work yourself, but the people around you and the things you have to give up is, is a huge, is a huge price to get there. Yes. Um, that is a really great point. Um, my husband and I didn't, weren't given anything to start. It, we were given a lot of support emotionally, mentally. And, you know, my husband's two parents are attorneys and my family owns a furniture store. So we got furniture and we got legal advice, yep. which, both of those things were super important, but there was nothing beyond that, which is, you know, looking back, like, that's amazing. That's so humbling. We did this all ourselves with a few dollars. Um, and, you know, my husband had, he went to a private Jesuit school and he had all these student loans and we had car payments. And so we didn't want to move in together before we were married, but it was like, you can't have two rents, you know, when you started a company and you have to live off my dime. You can't use your, so it was, um, there were things that we sacrificed for sure. Um, when friends would be like, Hey, you never come out with us anymore. You never hang out with us anymore. And it's like, because I work 15 hour days and the last thing I want to do is, you know, go to a bar or go hang out at a restaurant. Like I want to sleep and yep. you don't get weekends, Saturdays and Sundays are on Monday and Tuesday. And it's, and, and I totally understand when people say, um, when you love what you're doing, you never work a day in your life. It doesn't matter. If you love what you're doing, you are always working. There is always some kind of hurdle you have to overcome and some kind of, you know, something is going to knock you down 
twice a week. You know, we are constantly fighting battles. And, you know, when you deal with so many mass sales too, especially with people that aren't even in the U.S. or the other side of the world, they're, I can't get this to work. How do I do this? It's like you're always trying to figure out a way to ease everything and make sure everything is smoothly operating and Wi-Fi goes out in the whole area. Well, then guess what? All the girls have to go home and work because you can't work. And the phone goes out, you know, one day, one week. And it's like, it's always something. And so, yes, I love what I do. And I would do it tomorrow. And I do it the next day. And I do it over and over. It still works, though. Like, at the end of the day, it is still seven days a week, no matter what. No matter what, that I'm year two, still working seven days a week. That's awesome. And that ties perfectly into our uh podcast topic last week, which was on resiliency in the business, in the workplace, and just in life, honestly. Um, and you being resilient in your business, I'm hearing how you've had to send girls home from Wi-Fi issues and everything all over the, all over the scale. Um, but how have you been able to sustain your quality and, you know, keep everything up to your standards over the few years that you've been open? Um, okay. So one thing that I learned working for older men in the industry and just men in general, is that they're okay with putting their foot down and putting the client in their place and it always being the client's fault and making sure the client knows that. And I hated it because the client would leave resentful and I just felt like nothing was accomplished. And so when I built Lindsay Lee, I was like, customer service has to be the most important thing for me because, sorry, the birds are chirping. Um, Oh, it sounds great. Has to be my number one thing that drives me. If something's wrong, just tell us don't you know don't hold back and just be resentful because consumer remorse is my is what keeps me up at night and gives me nightmares i want to make sure that everyone's taken care of and that we fix it and we get it right are there going to be human errors with the manufacturer because you know they didn't solder something totally close yes that's going to happen and i'm going to fix it if you you know something happens to your ring and you are biking you fall off and you knock a prong i'm going to fix it like we have these standards that we, that we follow that no matter what, I'll tell you if it really is your fault, but I'm still going to fix it. I just want you to know, Hey girl. Yeah. I know you ran to the wall and you're biking to a brick wall. I saw it. I can see it on your ring. Right. I got, you, you know, like yep. I'm still going to fix it for you, but I'm not going to shame you for it. Um, which was super important. And I'll, 99% of the time I'll take the blame. Um, because at the end of the day, when I buy something, I want to make sure I'm totally content, totally happy because I'm investing in a piece that I know that collection is going to grow. So I also want people to invest in us and know that we want to grow it with them, not just think that she did this. You know, I want to make sure that they're taken care of. Yeah. And, and that creates, you know, a, a lasting customer base. And like you said, loyal customers and word of mouth. And like you talked about how your business grew was really you know, things getting promoted on social media and being shared across. So we'll make sure we will include, um, you know, your Instagram handle and website uh, information in in the bio for this and and on YouTube. But, you know, what, I guess the thing that people probably want to hear out, you know, that are listening is we've heard kind of the growth to this point. So what do you see is next for Lindsay Lee Jewelry? What's the, what's the next few years look like? What are your goals for it? I, I know, you know, you're moving into a bigger spot for your brick and mortar store, but you know, anything else that you want to, you know, talk to us about what you're going forward with? These are conversations my husband and I have every other day. Um, he has every day. And and that's another thing too, which when you have a small business that you're starting, um, even if it's 10 years old, 15 years old, you always have to be thinking about tomorrow, always be thinking about the future. And so you don't go home and have a normal conversation about like what's going on in the world you have conversations about like okay so what are we going to do to conquer this what's going on in the world what are we going to do to you know what's the next five years ten years what's the plan and so it's funny because my husband has like these massive ideas and visions and he's like the mastermind thing and I'm like the I can't imagine doing that right now I'm so tired just from today like um so it, it kind of depends on the day I I see us um moving in out of our 600 little square foot nook into you know a building we just got across the street that's 2200 square feet to figure out how to work in a square space like that we're not sharing desks um and then maybe multiplications i say that's a while out my 
next move, I think, is I want to move some things in house, like just have a bench jeweler. Um, I do a lot of my manufacturing. Mostly all my custom stuff is here made in Houston. So we have really high quality control and we can stay on top of it and we can rush jobs and we can pick up jobs when we need to every day. Um, so it makes it really easy, but doing the trips around Houston get yep. tired. So maybe my husband and I thought about possibly moving some of it in-house to have done. Mm -hmm. um, but that's like exhausting to think about too. Um, always growing. I'm always just trying to grow my team because every day we get bigger and bigger. And so to me, having a team is the most important thing because I, after the last two years, I'm tired of having the weight all on my shoulders that I want girls to learn, girls to grow, girls to, you know, put everything in here like I've done and just be successful with it too. No, oh, I think that's fantastic. And I think, you know, you talking about empowering, you know, the women that you work with, as well as yourself to continue to do that and continue to grow. And most importantly, you know, you have said multiple times during this conversation, I know Alex and I, you know, both noticed it was, you mentioned how important quality and customer service continues to be even as you grow. So, you know, yes. we, are, we are looking forward to seeing the next chapter of Lindsay Lee Jewelry and we're excited about it. And we thank you so much for coming on today. Me too. I'm excited. Thank y'all for having me. All right. We now move into quick hits with managing partner, Bobby Dixon. Bobby, how are you doing today? I'm good, guys. How are you guys doing on this Wednesday afternoon? We are doing well. We've had uh, a good podcast so far, some good interview with Lindsay Lee, and then some good topic um, you know, debate here on some of the things we're about to cover. So we wanted to kick a couple questions to you. So as someone who has several times left positions at big corporations to start your own journey, what would you say to the aspiring entrepreneur who is at a big corporation now, but considering leaving to start his own endeavor? Yeah. So that question takes me back, you know, Tay, and, and I, I appreciate the question. I, I think yeah, the first thing I would say to the aspiring entrepreneur is sort of, you know, what is the vision, right? Um, I think you can, you can find good people. Uh, you can find resources. You can capitalize things. You, you can do all those, those things you have to do to get a business up and running. But what is the vision, right? Uh, and is that vision something that sort of gets your blood pumping, uh, you know, gets your temperature rising, kind of the passion in you going, right, to get up and, and, uh, and get after it every day, right? So kind of what is the vision would be the first thing. Um, the second thing would be kind of count the cost, right, uh, before you get into anything via uh, investing time, money, or energy, right, you know, count the cost, right? Uh, and as you count the cost, uh, sort of, you know, um, is the risk worth it, right? When you think about, you know, uh, whether it's a financial risk, whether it's a personal risk, uh, whether it's a relational risk, uh, is it worth it, right? You know, so having counted the cost and assessed the risk, I think the, um, the other thing I would say is what is the opportunity cost, right? You know, so you've got the literal cost and the opportunity cost. A lot of people I talk to you know, have kind of labored in large corporations and there's just this risk component to it, right? I, I don't want to take the risk, right? Uh, and to that, I simply say, well, what is more risky, right? Um, you know, in that corporate position, you could, and I've seen this happen, um, do all that your job requires you to do, and in some cases, exceed expectations, right? Um, and for reasons that have nothing to do with how you performed on your role, be it market context, uh, industry context, or uh, you know performance-based context within the company, you know you may get laid off, right? Uh, and so uh, that's a situation where you did your job and you still lost your job, right? Uh, so there's an element of risk involved with working for large corporations. And you think about it and you say, if it were a horse race, right, which horse would I bet on? Right. Uh, and if you believe in yourself uh, and you believe in that horse being you, then I would say that's a risk mitigating factor. Right. You know, so there's vision. You have to count the cost. Uh, you've got to understand yourself a little bit. 
uh, and sort of mitigate all the risk. And that's what I would say, right? You know, and if those answers kind of you draw your pros and cons, if they add up for you, I say life is short, man, go for it. Good, yeah. that's good. I mean, after you assess those risks and, uh, you know, those opportunity costs, another word that gets thrown around is passion. Um, you know, past, people want to go to a job that they have passion for, want to build something that they want to grow on. Um, that word gets thrown around a lot by entrepreneurs. Um, but did your jump have to do with passion at, in that industry that you wanted to be in? Or uh, were you trying to just deliver something different to your clients? Yeah, that's a good point, uh, Alex. And I, I would say, you know, firstly, you know, to the point about passion, I mean, you can do hobbies that you're passionate about. Right. You know, you can contribute to charities that yep. you're passionate about. You can work uh, in the community uh, on things that you're passionate about. So mm -hmm. uh, passion has to be measured. Right. And I won't be redundant. Right. But I would still say, hey, you know, uh, somebody much wiser than me said a long time ago where there's no vision. Right. The people will perish. Right. You know, so you have to have a vision uh, that's going to supplement uh, whatever passion you have for what for what you uh because that's the thing that you subscribe to, right? And have to measure back to uh, kind of a guide and compass, right? So that, that would be my first sort of point to your question. Um, the, 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 the personal <laughs> analysis uh, is kind of, you know, as much as we talk about vision and passion and knowing what you want to do, uh, for me, it was more about knowing what I didn't want to do, right? You know, I was sitting in a large firm, uh, having worked about 36 hours straight, uh, it was the weekend. Uh, we were working on a synergy analysis. Um, the, the, the partners at the time were kind of banging my head about, uh, you know, how to run these models, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and, you know, I had been toiling on some entrepreneurial ventures right, while I was in business school and, 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 and that sort of thing. So, again, it was opportunity costs. I, I had what I felt like were some opportunities uh, and there was costs associated with not taking those opportunities at the time. So I realized in a moment what I didn't want to do, Alex, uh, you know, and, and for me, it was I didn't want to, um, you know, stay there uh, on what they call the partner track and because I saw what the partner track looked like. And that's, that's the other thing, right, is, is as you're, uh, you know, assessing your aspirations, sort of what does the end look like when you get there, right, you know, uh, and is that worth the journey? And for me, it kind of, you know, when I asked myself, was it worth the journey? I, I um, concluded, right, that uh, I knew what I didn't want to do, right? And so I made the call and I uh, decided to jump out of the boat, so to speak. Uh, and having jumped out of the boat, uh, you just, you learn how to sink or swim. Uh, you know, you learn a lot about yourself from a resiliency standpoint, perseverance and all those sorts of things, right? And so uh, that was kind of my deciding factor, right? And, you know, since then, as you mentioned, there's been several ventures, not all successful, but the one thing that I always rally around is what I don't want to do. Right. You, you know, so we just go back that way. Right. So, you know, you just kind of find a way to, to keep going. Yeah, no, I think that's a great point. And you really hit on, uh, I think a key point in resiliency there, which leads us into kind of our, our, our next question here, which is, you know, the importance of the community and what you're doing as an entrepreneur. So Athenian, you know, we are involved in a number of local community initiatives, whether it's with schools, universities, uh, Texas Children's, whatever it may be. And so we spend a lot of time in our community and giving back to our areas and working with people in our community. How important do you see that involvement being in um, entrepreneurs and making sure that they're kind of being passionate about not only what they're going after, but their community as well? Yeah, so personally, uh, very important, right? I mean, that, that gets back to sort of a, a, a personal assessment, right? And understanding yourself. But, you know, for me, <clears throat> kind of going back to some of these other questions, right? If I were ever to be an entrepreneur, you always tell yourself, if, 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 if I could run something, if I could do it, how would I go about it? What would be important? Um, and, you know, one of the things that's always been important to me is, is giving back to the community. <clears throat> there, there's a community within which you live. There's a community within which you come from. You know, there's the community within which you, uh, you know, have classmates, cohorts, um, you know, teammates. You know, if you were an athlete, you know, there are uh, religious affiliations, churches. Uh, in my case, you know, I came up uh, through some organizations that had a, a profound impact on my life, the uh, summer track and, and, and those sorts of things. And so you define community right uh based on sort of you know what's impacted your life 
know, past, present, and future. And um, yeah, for me, I think it, it's very important, right? It, it is um, it is almost as important as the mission itself to me, right? Y- y- you know, um, to uh, to make sure that I'm not necessarily just giving back in terms of treasure, right? If that be financial means, but but talent, right? Uh, in terms of kind of what I can uh, seed into somebody's life, uh, and the other would be time, right? Uh, you know, is is those kind of you know talent, treasure, and time would probably be the the three sort of um, you know things you can contribute, right? So so to answer your question, I, I think it's very important. Um, it is a personal assessment. Uh, we've talked on a, on a on a previous podcast about. Uh, different philosophies of, of 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 what a corporation's you know mandate right you know it should be and, and some would say it's simply to return value to the shareholders I, I would submit that 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 you do have a, a civic and communal responsibility right uh, and so you know if anybody asks me that that would be my perspective yeah I that's think that's on. yeah Alex and I obviously you know, agree and, and are hundred percent behind that mission we heard the same thing from Lindsay Schultz earlier and she talked about how you know, not only is she very passionate about providing a better experience for the customer and creating long-term value there, but also in some of the charities that she works in. And, you know, she's obviously supporting a, a culture that is, you know, a, a woman-owned business in a space that there's not a lot of women working, uh, similar to, you know, Athenian being a minority-owned business and finding ways to not only you know, improve what you're doing as a business, but to leave a legacy in your community and causes you care about. So I think uh, for me, it's really cool to hear that from both perspectives and, and to hear from kind of two different companies is, is what they're working for and two entrepreneurial journeys that really, I mean, similar in a lot of ways, Alex, I think you would agree, um, you know, in a big corporation growing up and, and, and going up the ladder really fast, right? Bobby talking about the track he was on and, and Lindsay talking about as well and hearing how they kind of got to the point where they're at now. So Bobby, we just really thank having you on, man. It was great. Another great week on uh, Wise Council here, and we're looking forward to having you next week. Yeah, I appreciate it. You know, the, 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 this is a topic that's sort of near and dear to me, as you guys know, my philosophy, all these things. You know, in parting, I would simply say uh, you can be profitable, yeah, which is the objective and goal of any for-profit business, right? You can be profitable. But, but to these other questions and points you raised, right, impactful is yet another thing, right? You know, and sometimes you can be impactful by being profitable, but not necessarily, right? You know, right. so, uh, I, you know, I, I believe that, you know, at, you know, to whom much is given, right? Much is required. And, and part of that requirement is to be impactful, you know, you know towards your employees, uh, to your community, uh, cohorts, et cetera. So uh, I think that would be the last thing I'd have to say. And I appreciate you having me. Uh, thank you. Yeah, that was great. Catch thank you, again you so week. much. Now let's head into the cool down. Some closing thoughts to wrap up this episode. So Tanya, anything that you're listening to, reading this week, or you know, to help with growth and productivity? So I'm sure you're going to have a very similar answer because it's been a very busy seven days since the last podcast. Mostly, I have been reading and listening to uh, proposals and proposal thoughts and review, but I did get to listen to a few episodes of the disruptive voice podcast. Um, specifically the one I listened to last time was the, uh, was a description of how a group brought cellular phones to Africa and essentially created connectivity in a space where people didn't think that was possible before. So with Telcel and now Africa is projected in the next 10 years to have more mobile phones than any, uh, continent, uh, except for Asia. So I thought that was pretty impressive. Wow. That's crazy. Yeah. I'm pretty much the same answer with you. We've been uh, just reading and writing proposals all week and, uh, haven't really caught up with any of my podcasts or books lately. I've been at night working on my wife's closet. So I'm, you know, technically working on my growth and productivity and carpentry for you know, sure, right now. For sure, yeah. Uh, but other than that, you know, not too much this week, man. So let's jump into the big three this week. So our big three, as we mentioned earlier, is uh, underrated entrepreneurial success stories. So we talked a little bit yesterday about um, some of the big time entrepreneurs uh, with Alex and myself. And we were like, well, let's try and come up with a few that are not as widely known. So Mm -hmm. Alex, because I took two of your three last week, I'm going to let you go first today uh, with with your big three. Yeah. I mean, my first 
just a couple honorable mentions, of course, Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates just, you know, automatically come to mind when you think the about best, entrepreneurs, goat, you know, goat, so sure. I got had to, had to just throw those in there just real quick. But um, the first ones that come to mind are the, you know, Netflix CEO, uh, Mark Randolph and uh, or Netflix founders, I should say, Mark Randolph and Reed Hastings and the Airbnb founders uh, who are also like roommates, I think, and schoolmates in school, uh, like Brian Chesky and, and Joe Gibbia. I mean, you know, coming up with the ideas that they did at the time that they did when, you know, Netflix pitching a blockbuster where nobody thought like, you know, why would anybody want a DVD to their door, you know? Yeah. And then, you know, the Airbnb founders of thinking, you know, why would somebody want to stay at your house? You know, why would somebody, I could just go to a hotel. What, what, what's the fun in that? You know, uh, yeah. Airbnb, a ma- air mattress on your living room floor. Who, who thinks of that? You know, For and sure. those guys seeing the vision early, the true nature of an entrepreneur and finding that niche uh, out there that that's being uncovered by the market. Oh, for sure. Those people are all true disruptors, right? If you think about the status quo, right? You mentioned Blockbuster. That's that's funny. You actually said that. I watched a video on Blockbuster's rise and fall uh, the other day. It was it was a forty seven wow. second video, and it showed how <laughs> Blockbuster went from I think there was at one point like seven thousand locations, mm-hmm. um, and it took sixteen years to build that, and within five years they had one location. Wow. It was wild. Five years. Sorry, sidebar there. But I, no, I thought no, that no, was that was one of the wildest little visual montages I'd seen because I obviously grew up going to block. Yeah, of course. So, so my uh, my first one is Tillman Fertitta. So mm-hmm. a lot of people outside of Houston may not know who Tillman Fertitta is as much. Uh, I, obviously, he's the owner of the Rockets, but that was kind of the last step, I would say, of his entrepreneurial journey. He started as a as a bus boy and worked his way up the restaurant industry t- until he uh, got in as a partner at Landry's seafood uh, company. So you think about that, you think about obviously Landry's is one of the restaurants, but another one is Bubba Gump. Um, there's several other that are under that umbrella. So if you've been, chances are, if you've been to a coastal city that has a commercialized area, you have e- eaten at one of Tillman Fertitta's restaurants. He also owns a bunch of hotels and casinos now. So, uh, he has kind of grown from, you know, really what I would say the bottom of the pole and has grown up to be you know, one of the most successful entrepreneurs in the U.S. Yeah, crazy, man. Tillman Fatita is a big, big face here in Houston. Uh, so a lot of us kind of know about him, but he's definitely underrated. My second one isn't underrated at all, but I wanted to mention them. Uh, Oprah Winfrey. Um, you know, born into poverty in, you know, rural Mississippi uh, to a teenage single mom, you know, then moved to, I think, Milwaukee, uh, you know, kind of was molested at a young age, you know, had, got pregnant in her early teens and now has a, you know, $2.7 billion empire. Um, talk show host, actress, TV producer, media executive, philanthropist, doing it all now. And of course, a book club, you know, can't, you can't, can't be a philanthropist it, without a book club, you yeah. know what I mean? But yeah, I just wanted to bring her up because, you know, just from coming from that background and, and leading to you know, what she became today, just starting off as being a, a simple radio host, I think in Milwaukee to the empires that she built today is crazy. Yeah. I mean, Oprah is, uh, when I think of entrepreneur, I definitely think of Oprah and I think of success stories. That's a, that's a great one. So good call there. My next one um, is also a woman is Sarah Blakely. So this is another one that I think hides under the radar for a lot of people, but her story was truly disruptive to this market as a whole. So Sarah Blakely founded and started the company Spanx, uh, which for a lot of women listeners out there, they're like, oh yeah, of course, that, that makes sense. But for the, the males out there that might not know, Spanx was really the first like compression, like Under Armour type material that uh, people were wearing. Um, and they make Spanx for men and women, but it was really made to be uh, you know, useful in the workplace, but also in the athletic life as well. And she started in her living room uh, making this happen. And pitched to a whole bunch of people and, you know, it didn't hit, didn't hit. And then she just kept pushing and got funding and is now, you know, one of the most successful women entrepreneurs in the United States and has really changed that whole performance and undergarment industry um, completely. So I, I think she's, she's a great one to look at. Solid. That's solid. I love how you bring bringing up this on these underrated people. Let's people know out there know like, you know, if you can do it too, you know, yeah, and don't sure. stop after your first pitch, you know, you can do it too. You can be become one of these guys one day that has this huge empire and huge following and, you know, make loads of cash doing what you like, man, you know? Yep. <laughs> but my last one is a guy that I've heard about, I think from like one of my former bosses, um, his name's Mike Cassidy. 
is a, they call him the startup king. He's literally sold four startups for around five hundred million dollars. Wow. And his first successful startup, I mean, I think it started with five hundred bucks each from him and and two buddies. Um, in 2012, he ended up being, you know, the director of product management at Google. And now I think last reported in 2017, he's working on a startup for clean energy. So hopefully that comes to fruition as well. And he's selling another company for a billion dollars soon that we can all get some clean energy out here. But uh, taking, you know, nothing to something um, is definitely this guy's bag. Yeah. I, I mean, anytime you're starting multiple job like industry jobs like that and businesses like that, I think that's really something to say because we know how hard it is to do one right so yeah, i can't right, imagine right. doing multiple <laughs> uh so my last one is andre young also known as dr dre uh, i think i love dr dre's story because i think that you know in, in music and in athletics unfortunately we see all the time the story on sports center or on mm -hmm. the news it's like you know they made a ton of money and then they've lost it all Right. And so I think it's hard to, I think, sustain that lifestyle. So what I admire most about Dr. Dre is, so, you know, the guy started from really humble beginnings, started making beats, you know, became a part of NWA, um, obviously had a tremendous rap career and producing career, right? If you think about Aftermath and having, you know, Eminem and, and the team that he had there mm -hmm. and, and then really building Interscope Records. I mean, the guy is, is a legend, right? So, then he, you know, transfers over and goes into the entrepreneurial side and starts Beats by Dre, which really just spawned out of him wanting to have good headphones for his producing and for yep. his music. So I think that was really impressive and, you know, ended up selling Beats by Dre for a ton of money and, you know, is a billionaire. Yeah. And, and I think his story of just continuing to find ways to make his industry better, like mm -hmm. things that you know, I listened to him interviewed about it. And he talked about it. He's like, well, I felt like the beats that were being made weren't edgy enough. And then I felt like right. the headphones that were being made weren't quality enough, but also have enough style. And then, you know, we just continue to grow it and diversify. And, and now I think he's, you know, for me, one of the role model entrepreneurs to look up to as far as what he's done in his career. Absolutely. Like, just like um, Lindsay said earlier, just finding a niche in, in their career path and in their industry um, and exploiting it and taking advantage of it. So, so we had, so we're on the Q and a now we, gotcha, gotcha. We, we, we have two questions today. So I'm going to read the first one and then I'll let Alex read the second one. So thank Perfect. you guys for continuing to send in questions. Uh, these are great, honestly, because we get to a better understanding, not only of how to help you, but of how to shape our episodes going forward, because we kind of understand what you're looking for, which is great. So uh, our first Q and a was um, from one of our listeners says, guys, thank you for the great content and for helping guide my business as part of my plan to build a resilient business i'm looking to target a different customer base than i do now where should i start first so this is a good question this, yeah, this, a good is, question. this is a good question and the yeah. reason i say that is and alex you can back me up on this is we spend as a business and most businesses do spend a lot of time figuring out what the best target market is mm -hmm. And because of that, you tailor everything you do to that target market to try and draw them in. So when you're trying to find a different target market, you have to resegment what you're looking to do. So yeah. you need to re-engineer the values that, that your customer base wants to find in that product or in that service. So if you're thinking about right now, we have customer group A as our target market. And we're doing well, but... To, to the point in the question, right? To be more resilient, we want to diversify a bit and have some, you know, some, some roots in other places. So we go after target group B. So when you think about that, the values of target A and target B are probably different in what they're looking for in a product, if what, what they're looking to spend price-wise, what they're looking to um, get as far as delivery of the product. So I think you have to look at and understand truly what that group is looking for. And this may include diversifying your product line. We just talked about what Dr. Dre did, right? Originally they had the $300 over the ear, big bulky headphones, which was great for DJs and for people that really wanted to listen to music. But they started to realize that, Hey, we have a market in the fitness industry here. So let's do the in-ear ear pods. They also found, Hey, there's the casual person that wants to listen to this. So let's do the wired headphones. So right. I think you have to look at the group that you want to go after um, and oftentimes this is race or this is age, or this is, 
you know, demographic, whatever it is, societal, you know, income and figure out how to target that group and then figure out how you re-engineer your offering to do that. Right. So if you're a consultant, if you're, you know, a service business, you may have to think about ways to do more cost effective delivery or more user friendly delivery. Um, and, and so that's where I would start. What about you, Alex? I mean, you took the words right out of my mouth. That's the, the main thing that comes to mind finding and making sure you want to go after this target customer base. But um, I think the main thing that I would look at first is probably just making sure that my company and my uh, infrastructure as a whole can fit, you know, that customer target that we're going after. If everything is already engineered and, and working for customer A, um, the second thing I want to do is figure out, okay, if we're going to go after customer B, is everything that we're doing in-house, does it need to change? Is it going to cost more? Um, is it, do we need to adjust marketing? Will, will the, you know, will, you know, what will it affect in our, in our office, you know, it just make sure that everything will still be aligned, still be able to, to work with this machine that we're working on as we move everything to customer B. So we're not taking on any uh, excess needs and hitting our EBITDA targets. Yeah, no, that's dead on, dead on. Yeah. So uh, second question we have uh, says, what's you guys morning routine as you all are working from home to stay on task and focus during Corona? For me, most days it's just pretty simple. Uh, you know, get up for the gym, come home, walk the dog, eat breakfast, shower, try to be at my desk at like eight, eight thirty. Um, and honestly, that helps me stay focused and productive throughout the day. Some days when I don't go, um, it just helps me like I, I'm kind of off, you know. So, uh, but I want to find that consistency. I think that's that's super important. Um, honestly, that's 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 my that's my advice. You know, whatever you do, um, just to kind of commit to doing it every day, you know, starting your day with a sense of, you know, control of your life. So I feel like, you know, I go to the gym so I can control that start of it. And then the rest of the day, it gets a little bit a lot easier and, and kind of helps you stay focused during the day to do everything else correctly. Oh, 100%. I think consistency was the key there, especially during quarantine. So I would say that during a, a normal non-quarantine world, my day starts with going to the gym and then doing several other things before I get rolling at the office. During quarantine, I've actually kind of found that I am more productive with a little different setup than I would normally have during a, uh, you know, a normal calendar year. So right. I have been doing things a little differently. So I've been waking up at about the same time. So, uh, you know, early in the morning, and then I have been going and actually doing like a little bit of quiet time. So I find that as like either meditation or reading a little bit, you know, in the Bible or having some quick prayer and then moving into honestly reading through, I've been reading through either, you know, the, a daily skim of some of the normal like topics I look at or investment mm -hmm. stuff. And then, you know, have a cup of coffee and kind of sit down on my, at my desk and, and get going for the day. I know for me that, finding that time to decompress a little bit and reset really helps because I, I feel like otherwise things carry into my work life that wouldn't right. normally be there. Yeah. And then, you know, I spend the morning, um, you know, working with clients, working on projects with you, working through what, whatever it may be. And then I've been actually doing my workout either at, during lunchtime instead of eating lunch, right? Going to hitting the workout then and then snacking on something later in the day or at the end of the day, because I find that otherwise I feel like I, go work out in the morning early and then I'm at the house from, you know, 7 a.m. through yeah. the end of the day and I just need a little bit of breakup. So for me, that's been really, really good as kind of a new, I would say, quarantine strategy that I hadn't had before and kind of mixing it up to try and find, you know, the best you know mix for, for me on a daily basis. Sounds good, man. That's a way to keep it going. Yeah, I think I think it's been interesting for everyone's routine to shift a little bit during quarantine because I think if we would have had this question six months ago, yeah, it would have yeah. been really different for both of us. It would have been get <laughs> up, go to the gym, get on the airplane, go, you know, get in the right. Uber to go to the office, whatever it is. Right. Um, so this is a little different, but yeah, I, I thought you were I thought you were gonna say that you uh, didn't want to stay at home after a workout all day long and just gonna snack the whole time. <laughs> uh, no, I, I've been. I will say though, uh, and I was slightly off topic, but since I got married, my wife does a phenomenal job of keeping our pantry stocked, which is something that when I lived by myself was not oh, a yeah. thing because no, not at all. if it's there, I'm eating it. Right. Yeah. So I've, I've, that's taken me a while to adjust from for sure. Certainly. Right. Right. <laughs> well, I think we had uh, some great content today. I think the information from Lindsay on how to kind of chase that passion and you know, chase the entrepreneurial dream, I think was really good, but also the realities of it. And then Bobby, I think backed up everything she said and, and brought in, 
you know, some insight from different industries. So I thought that was really good. I'm also really pumped about our guest for next week as well. Um, I don't want to bring it up yet, but I, I think you guys are going to be really excited as well. Someone who has done a lot um, in many sectors and, and, and has grown quite a bit to be you know, a very successful and very well-respected person. So we're excited to bring uh, that person on next week. But guys, as always, take time to breathe and focus on your current situation. Adversity breeds ingenuity. And Alex? Ice Council is a sustainable result.